¿Te está diciendo cinco? Sí. Bueno, eh, tenemos con nosotros a Javier López Martín. En este momento... López Martín. Eh, Let me tell you that he's now studying an important wreck. And when I say important, I mean this was the vessel uh, that uh, Charles V, the emperor, or Charles I in English, uh, used the king himself. And then I also have here with us uh, Javier Zulaika, uh, who is the specialist uh, in the Basque expedition that uh, went around the world for the first time, the first circumnavigation. He's, he's going to tell us about carpentry, I believe. Well, I've only been given five minutes, uh, so I'm just about to start an important, uh, an impossible task. You people are specialists uh, in wrecks, in reconstruction uh, and replica, whereas in our case, uh, we do the complete opposite. Uh, we uh, start from the whole story and uh, then hopefully uh, get to small details. I'm, I'm going to tell you about this merchant ship uh, that was uh, made in Denmark uh, by uh, King Hans to defend uh, Baltic trade for Denmark. Denmark closed the strait uh, to the Baltic, Baltic uh, and there was the war uh, with the Hanseatic League. Uh, King Hans uh, organized a fleet, and one of these ships was Engelin, uh, which is uh, the vessel I'm going to tell you about. There were a number of trade agreements uh, for important for the Danish crown, and uh, as a result of that, the uh, Duchess of Austria, uh, who was a Spanish princess, uh, was engaged uh, to uh, a Danish prince. We often hear about uh, the Trastamara and Aragon um, engagements and their connection with trade agreements. Well, that's how this vessel uh, was lent uh, by the Danish crown uh, to uh, Charles the King to go to the Netherlands and wage his war uh, at the Weldres Duchy in the Netherlands. A huge vessel uh, for its time, around about uh, 45 meters in length, uh, 42 meters uh, for the main mast, and uh, at the beginning of its life, uh, it was described as a hen surrounded by her chicks. So, the ship uh, got to the Netherlands and uh, the ship uh, was uh, selected uh, to, for the voyage of the king for the emperor to come to Spain for the first time. But before that voyage, uh, 35 ships were sent from which got together in Guipúzcoa and Biscay and Cantabria uh, on the northern Spanish coast. And we have information about the names of the ships and uh, their size. Uh, so uh, in that group of vessels, there were also some carvels. Uh, one of those carvels uh, was huge uh, for 850 uh, casks or barricas in size. So, uh, uh, the voyage uh, was not simple. Uh, the emperor had to sign an agreement uh, with Henry VIII of England, had to solve some military disputes he had, uh, different uh, 
preconditions. But finally, the fleet uh, got uh, to where the emperor was, but he decided that he wanted to come to Spain in the summer of uh, 1517. Finally, uh, he got that fleet together with Engelen, this vessel, uh, to wage his war uh, in the Netherlands. After all of that was solved, uh, they finally sailed in 1517 uh, together with uh, a fleet of 42 vessels. Anyway, uh, there were a number of uh, conditions uh, and situations in Spain. He got uh, Fernando de Fernando uh, to lead that fleet. Uh, the emperor couldn't speak Spanish. And uh, they finally got to Tazones, a very small village uh, in, uh, on the Spanish northern coast. Those 42 ships uh, got to Tazones in northern Spain. Uh, the emperor went uh, to Valladolid, then uh, central Spain, avoiding uh, Cardinal Cisneros and all the powers that be uh, in the kingdom. At that time, uh, the fleet uh, was sent uh, to wait for him in Santander, and uh, all the artillery and uh, the horses uh, waited there in Santander. Uh, the Engelen uh, was sent to Pasaya, to Pasajes, and that was the time when the captain uh, in Pasaya uh, uh, was in charge of that vessel. Pasaya was meant to be a very safe harbor. So, if I had a lead, uh, the emperor uh, suffered a coup d'etat uh, fr uh, from his brother and uh, his brother Fernando, uh, who was finally sent uh, to the Netherlands as punishment. And Cardinal Cisneros, uh, the powerful cardinal, he had to accept that Charles, as the firstborn, uh, would finally be king. So, uh, in Valladolid, uh, Charles sent his brother to the Netherlands, as I said, and uh, the vessel that was appointed uh, for that voyage was the Engelen, uh, that had been waiting in Pasaya for six months. So we've got uh, sources of information about uh, how the rigging uh, was repaired, uh, the ballast was changed at that time because the ballast was sand uh, originally. Well, I'm just mentioning that because sometimes uh, you archaeologists find uh, sand uh, in the remains and it might be ballast. So, uh, finally, 600 tons of stone, in this case, uh, was used as ballast, uh, replacing the sand. Imagine the, the size of the ship. So, uh, the Newport uh, ship uh, presentation told us about the plants and um, uh, uh, creatures and all sorts uh, that were found. Well, the same thing in our case. Uh, we have all sorts of details about that. We uh, have records of names of the people uh, who uh, were involved in the preparation of the equipment and the supplies, uh, including women uh, with names. Um, sometimes w women have been forgotten in history, uh, uh, preparing the food and uh, helping with the rigging, uh, reparations, and so on. So, as soon as possible, uh, Charles uh, asked for his brother to leave for the Netherlands. In the political turmoil at that time, uh, there was uh, a notice on St. Francis convent uh, complaining about uh, Prince Fernando uh, being 
expelled from Spain. So at that time, 300 men uh, were appointed to escort uh, Prince Fernando uh, to Santander. Uh, they were taking so long to arrive that they asked uh, they asked uh, what the problem was. Well, finally, uh, the prince got to Santander uh, on the 3rd of May, and uh, just before that, uh, what happened is that the Engelin uh, was, uh, had, uh, there was a fire, and uh, it couldn't be used anymore uh, for, the, for this journey. This voyage. Well, finally, uh, the Eng the Engelen uh, was lost in Pasaya uh, by the riverside, and uh, the Spanish king. Uh, who was in Zaragoza at that time, ordered for all the artillery to be recovered. Uh, on the 1st of May, uh, a document uh, explains how uh, the main mast uh, had been cut down uh, to try and stop the fire. Uh, well, that attempt failed, uh, quite simply because of the tar uh, reparations. The tar was hot at that time, and uh, during the storm, uh, it's, the hot tar ended up uh, on the deck. We don't really know uh, if the fire was a sabotage, if it was intentional. Uh, there are clues that made us make, make us think that it might have been intentional. So, uh, a number of teams were organized, and the documents explain how in low tide uh, you could see part of the uh, ship structure, but not in the high tide. So uh, these men, these teams, uh, started uh, salvaging uh, the cannons, the artillery. We have lists of those people, those men's names, uh, also women who helped uh, take the cannons to the pinazas. Uh, so that the artillery could then take, uh, be taken. And funnily enough, uh, the documents talk about these two men uh, who get paid twice as much as the rest uh, because of their underwater skills, because of their diving skills. Uh, I think it's uh, one of the first situation where uh, drawings uh, are shown uh, with these men driving, recovering uh, 119 firearms, including a complete uh, cannons and rifles, different weapons, firearms. In our research, uh, we have then found that the artillery was then distributed uh, here in the Basque Country and the neighboring region of Navarre. At that time, uh, the king uh, asked to uh, recover the ship, which is something that Henry VIII tried to do with the Mary Rose. You know, the Dean brothers uh, recovered some of those cannons uh, in the 19th century. So, uh, Charles, uh, King Charles asked uh, people in Gipuzkoa uh, to uh, get together artisans and skilled people uh, to refloat the ship, specifying uh, what equipment will be needed, how much uh, these um, experts and, and will be paid. But um, the situation was uh, the, the ship was lying on its side. And because of the 600 tons of uh, stone ballast, uh, together with the weight of the vessel, uh, they were having 
real difficulties uh, carrying out their task. They started to complain and uh, they asked uh, neighboring towns and cities to uh, make a contribution uh, to be able to salvage the ship. Well, uh, these towns and cities complained, uh, said uh, this was uh, this this was a ship that belonged uh, to the Spanish king, and the crown, the Spanish crown, should then pay for it. We shouldn't forget uh, that uh, uh, Pasaya, uh, the ports, uh, had, uh, the town of Pasaya had the rights uh, to the port, not the neighboring cities. So, uh, in spite of all this goodwill, uh, the, sh the ship could not be uh, salvaged because of lack of funding. Uh, the Crown then said the, sh the vessel couldn't just be left uh, there blocking the river mouth. The question that was asked is how long will worms take uh, to eat through that wood and destroy it and unblock the river mouth? So, uh, that's uh, the last we know about the vessel until uh, the Spanish Civil War in the 20th century, where an, a cannon was found, uh, which is now here in San Sebastian in San Telmo Museum, uh, this bronze cannon that was made uh, in Hans and Christian's uh, kingdom, that is a, a Danish cannon. During the Spanish Civil War, uh, when Franco's troops were accessing Pasaya, uh, the a ship was maneuvering in the bay, in Pasaya, that ship uh, um, had problems uh, coming out of the bay. And to be honest, uh, we don't know yet uh, whether it was uh, that particular ship or a different ship. And I've been talking to the grandchildren of the diver. Uh, who found the civil war during the civil war because uh, in fact the so-called Rosita uh, comes from Dorsiken uh, in Dutch meaning I take a rose in my hand in that cannon, uh, the core of the cannon uh, was totally rusty. Uh, that rust uh, doesn't affect bronze, but it does uh, affect iron. So, uh, the uh, foundry, uh, that Danish foundry that made that cannon, this is the only example, uh, military example, uh, that uh, has been found around the world. And uh, only bells have been found so far from that foundry. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Unchi Museo Ari, Eta Xavier Alberdiri, Soriona. La verdad es que. Morning, congratulations to the organizers for uh, the organization of this excellent conference with extraordinary presentations we are enjoying. 
Let me first of all say that uh, I'm going to be presenting um, a poster uh, about something that goes beyond the content or the topic of this conference. Uh, it does, on the other hand, make reference to now Victoria and to the circumnavigation around the globe. Um, I'm going to be speaking about the maintenance and repairs that were carried out in the different uh, voyages. Um, the first uh, circumnavigation around the world um, led to um, the all types of situations. Um, here you have a list of uh, the carpenters that went on board this expedition. Out of the 11 specialists, six were Basques, uh, three came from Genoa, and um, it calls my attention that there was a lack of specialists and professionals from Andalusia and Castilla, which were the ones that would, at the time, carry out the repairs of the fleet. Uh, it would seem that the rough and the hard conditions of the expeditions were not very attractive to them. Most of the half of the uh, experts were Basque, and this is pretty much related to two facts. First, the long tradition existing in the Basque uh, coast, on the Basque coast, sorry, and the fact that uh, uh, both the uh, Maester of San Antonio, Juan de Lorriaga, and Maester of uh, now Concepcion, Elcano, uh, were Basque, and therefore they had uh, the chance to um, hire Basque yeah. experts La on board. The expedition can be divided into two main Sevilla areas, the first one from Seville to the Molucca Islands, and the second would go, or will cover from the Maluca Islands to San Lucar de Barrameda. Uh, here you see the first part of the expedition where four repairs were carried out. The ship stopped at San Julian Bay, which is in uh, the in Argentina, in the Patagonia area, with very cold waters and temperatures. On the other hand, the ships were in good uh, uh, condition. They've been sailing for a while. They had uh, spares, etc. And this is where one of the catastrophes of the expedition happened, when the now Santiago sank uh, as a consequence of the storm. The second repairs uh, were carried out a year later in a very difficult, different situation, uh, north to Borneo Island, the climate, weather conditions have nothing to do with the first repairs, but the Italian um, authors already uh, said that they didn't have the, the necessary tools and materials, and therefore he describes uh, the problems they had to face. And then after the Trinidad was loaded and Victoria now were uh, loaded with the whole, uh, with uh, the, the spices, and the Trinidad had problems, and therefore it will be repaired for three uh, months or even more, and then they try to go to America, uh, where the catastrophe happened. And on the other hand, now Victoria uh, goes towards Timor, to go towards the uh, uh, Mayua Island, and that's where the last repairs were carried out for a couple of weeks. And then. The second part of this expedition reflects how hard it was. And then uh, it will cover the Indian Sea uh, and the African part of the expedition. You see here that the starting point was not good. Uh, there was just one ship. They didn't have the support of other ships. It's uh, in bad condition after 29 months sailing. El Cano himself said that uh, the ship was not in good condition, and there's a fact that calls my attention here, which is out of five experts uh, that were still there, four stayed in the Trinidad ship, and only one, uh, Rujar, uh, 
y esto goes deja uh, a la victoria ahead with the Victoria uh, ship. And uh, therefore, the situation is very uh, difficult and uh, they're in a very vulnerable situation because if something happens to this computer, the uh, ship will be in a very bad uh, situation, which is what actually happened. In the Indian Sea, we see that the voyage on the ocean, um, we see that in this part of the expedition, the, the uh, ship doesn't stop at all. Only in Cape Bird. And uh, this happens for a number of reasons, maybe uh, mainly three. First, uh, because the Indian Ocean is an empty ocean, uh, unlike the uh, Pacific Ocean. They need to go up until 40 degrees latitude, south latitude to avoid Portuguese who are after them. And then, because we see here in some areas where they try to stop, for instance, the Amsterdam Island, or then in Africa, uh, this, um, they had problems when they uh, surrounded the Amsterdam island. They realized that they couldn't stop there at all because they're... Uh, La remontada del Atlántico hacia Cabo Verde uh, fundamentalmente se caracteriza uh, pues, por el Cape que Bird, va a de had, han 47 um, timos y al llegar uh, proximidades on board, de Cabo Verde, and when they came to Cape Verde, there was only 35 uh, members of the crew, eh, not enough to deal with the ship. Eh, Let's remember eh, that uh, when they burnt Concepción, Concepción, the, uh, había 108 the now Concepción, they burnt it because there were 108 people divided into three. That meant that there would be 33 members of the crew for each one of the ships, and that were not enough. And this is why they burnt one ship and they kept 50 members of the crew in each of the two remaining ships. Now they only have 35. Some of them are ill, some, other, some of those will die, so this is a very dramatic situation. And they stopped in Cape Verde to buy black slaves so that they helped them deal with the ship. Verde, obtienen, In Cape Verde, eh, alimentos, they got food supplies, the but then a, a catastrophe occurred. They're arrested by the Portuguese in the Santiago Island, you see here. And they, 13 of them are made prisoners. Amongst them, uh, the carpenter, they lose their skiff as well. And uh, now we have only 22 members of the crew, out of which four will die. 18 will reach destination. So this is not enough. They don't have a comfort carpenter anymore. So up until then, they carried out repairs from the external side of the ship. But in, in the past, I mean, but when they lost their skiff, they can't do this anymore, which means that they only have a pump uh, to go ahead. Uh, between Cape Verde and San Lucar, uh, the voyage is um, dramatic. Nobody uh, knows how they managed to reach their destination. And there are uh, writings telling us about the situation. Pedro Martil, Martin de Aguilera, uh, uh, author in the court, in the court uh, told us that um, the um, hull was uh, full of holes and uh, there were problems in the sails. Um, many elements were uh, totally ruined, and in spite of this, they managed to reach their destination. The testimony of Juan Sebastián Elcano tells us that they uh, found themselves in a situation where uh, they suffered a lot. Uh, they only had one bilge pump in order to solve the problems they had. So um, this is uh, one of the biggest stains in the sailing history. Uh, we can highlight that these men were very strong, they had good leadership, good knowledge uh, uh, by Juan Sebastián Elcano. Thank you very much.